my real fear with the metaverse is if we allow one company to dictate how this, what this looks like, um, I think that we fall into many of the same traps that we uh, have with Web2. Hello everyone and welcome yet to another episode of New Forum. New Forum brings together leaders, creators, new starters and new perspectives on crypto, the metaverse, NFTs, Social3 and DAOs. And please guys take a moment right now to like and subscribe to always stay informed of when the newest episodes of New Forum are coming. And on today's episode, we have Alexander Guy, growth expert at Zarian. He will share more about his role at Zarian soon. Alexander is a creative, pragmatic marketer with a focus on data-driven metrics and growth hacking methodologies. He comes from a Web 3.0 background, but started to move into Web 3.0 space. Today, we'll be discussing his experience and perspective on Web 3, DeFi, and how to strive in a decentralized world. Hi, Alexander. Thank you for taking time off your busy schedule to join us on today's episode. We're honored to have you here. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Really, really happy to be here. So uh, we could begin with you uh, telling us about yourself, who is Alexander, and a bit more about your role at Zarian. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I mentioned, or, you know, I, I sort of in the intro had uh, this idea of um, sort of coming from a Web 2 background and moving into Web 3 uh, pretty recently professionally. I, I joined Zerian in August. Um, prior to that, I'd spent about 10 years in London and Paris uh, in various startups in the, the more, uh, I didn't think about it as traditional at the time, but traditional Web 2 kind of companies. Um, worked for a number of different, uh, sort of across a number of different industries. Um, have kind of lived in a number of different uh, startup startup cycles from like early stage and like running out of money all the way up to like growing to over 200 people and being acquired. And so like I've kind of done a lot of different things across the, the sort of the spectrum of like the startup life, I guess. Um, pretty recently, you know, about a year and a half ago, I started getting really interested in NFTs um, mainly through the uh, fantasy football, fantasy soccer app called SoRare. Um, and, I, you know, being in tech and like in sort of this, this space, like I was aware of, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin and, and, and crypto in general and kind of saw it as like, a, like one of many innovative technologies, I guess. Uh, and we're talking like years ago. Um, and so I, I kind of like, I think missed the like early potential of what this could be. But for some reason, I think like a lot of people, um, you know, being a, 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 like the concept of like collection and ownership and like having these cards, these, these soccer cards, uh, you know, kind of uh, sort of live on the blockchain. Um, you know, every, every card has like the Etherscan address, you know, so you can see it, verify it. They recently added features so you can like actually send them to your, you know, your main wallet. It's so, like you really own them uh, in the same way that you build any type of collection or, or any kind of uh, an object that has any kind of rarity built into it uh, in the real world. And so this sort of like really clicked for me. Um, and after that, I, I think many, this like cliche of falling down the rabbit hole, uh, like 100% happened to me. And from that point on, I just like couldn't get enough of this. So I started thinking, you know, after one NFT project, started looking at other NFT projects. Um, like I'm really into uh, like sort of fantasy, like uh, books and like fantasy stories. And so like, you know, Forgotten Runes, Wizard Cult, like became like a thing I was interested in. Started getting into like involved in all these discords. You know, it, it really became something that I couldn't get enough of. And not long after that, I started thinking like, okay, well, clearly I need to start investing in Ethereum and buying Ethereum so that I can participate in these, in these uh, you know, NFT communities. Um, and quickly what I realized, especially if you manage uh, different wallets, multiple wallets, 
uh, it's kind of hard to track all your progress across this like environment. Um, everything's very spread out. Uh, there's oftentimes like, I think most people are aware of like the, uh, the transaction stress, you know, the wait, like I did a thing and like, then I'm waiting for an unknown number of minutes for the transaction to be confirmed, you know, so you're like sweating, you know, behind your computer screen. And so like, I came to, you know, basically started using Zerian, um, you know, started as a user. And when I saw they were looking for a head of marketing, uh, I basically reached out and was like, I, I need to get involved in this space. I, I think that it's it's fascinating. Uh, and so luckily, luckily they, they took a chance on uh, somebody with a more traditional startup background. Um, so now I, I, I've been in Syria for, for a few months now. And basically I am in charge of everything from a marketing and growth perspective, uh, setting the strategy. We're building out a new team. In fact, I'm hiring a number of positions in the team. We can talk about that at some point if, uh, if that's of interest. And um, yeah, so, so we're, we're, we're rolling at Zerian and trying to build out a clear, um, you know, data-driven marketing and growth strategy uh, to, to take us to the next level. Um, Hope that's not too long, long-winded. <laughs> oh, that's really, uh, that's really an interesting background. You know, you obviously have lived in different places and have a wide mm -hmm. uh, range of experience. And uh, like you just said, sometimes it's so strange. My mom was saying to me yesterday, "How is this possible? Like you're sending money and sending pictures as like NFTs around in the web. Like how does this even work?" And maybe for our audience who um, are not super like into the space yet, could you quick, quickly explain like how your transition from Web two or and to Web three kind of like uh, maybe impacted you? Explain what does that actually mean? Sure. Uh, it's a really good point. And I think a, a drawback of being like a believer in this space is sometimes you tend to like skip context. Uh, I think probably most people like Americans, you know, at Thanksgiving, when you come home, I'm sure like a lot of web Web 3.0 people were like <laughs> having to like evangelize this stuff to their families. And, and I'm no different. My mom's constantly asking me about all this stuff. But I think actually she's a great example of how to explain, like particularly the NFT side of things. If anybody doesn't know, NFT stands for non-fungible token. And effectively these are, well, they can be anything, but they are, uh, are digital artifacts encoded on the blockchain that, that then like represent ownership. So it's kind of like a, a deed, like for, for your house, right? But like it's in, it's it's essentially a record of your ownership, a certificate of authenticity, these sorts of things that are in the real world. And um, the unique thing about that in the digital context is that that deed, that proof of ownership, um, effectively can mean that you can own anything, like a digital representation of a player uh, in a in a soccer game that then can be used in a in a fantasy football kind of competition to earn real money. So play to earn gaming is like a very big trend right now in NFTs. There are many, not just uh, fantasy football uh, kind of use cases. There are like, you know, almost infinite number of gaming companies out there trying to do this same sort of um, ownership in, in a gaming context. But what it also means is that artists, musicians, um, you know, any kind of content creators of almost any kind can basically produce their work and then sell them to people across the world where you know you can own one of one copies like original copies of digital artwork or music um there are many platforms selling digital you know or nft music nfts right now um and the the unique thing about that is that basically it's it's just another way to guarantee ownership and allow someone to to basically verify that they are like the the the, the true owner of a given object um what that means is that a lot of um, a lot of what drives NFT prices is like the community behind them and the like sort of implied value. So what I mean by that is like if there are only 10,000 items and there are, let's say, 100,000 Twitter followers, well, you can do the math in terms of like, like where that market comes from. Um, and I think that in crypto, there's like kind of this, like, like Chris Dixon from, from Andreessen Horowitz, a really, really big um, angel investor and just active person in the Web3 space, especially on Twitter. If you don't follow him, follow Chris Dixon. He's a fantastic follow. But he talks a lot about how crypto is essentially money-backed currency. So cryptocurrencies are algorithmically um, sort of infused uh, currencies, right? So like the math is what makes them valuable. Um, 
And I think NFTs are sort of community-backed currency, where the community itself and the size of the community, the, the like how active and engaged the community is, actually is what drives their value. Um, does that answer your question? Is it clear? Uh, I can also go a little bit into the crypto side itself, but I was focusing specifically on, on um, NFTs. Like, would be yeah. great to hear your like your experience. You know, moving mm -hmm. from two to web three how is it like for you like some people are starting with learning uh like you know sure. definitions of stuff and mm. uh, we're just wondering like how how you yeah. transition to web three so for me like the, the, undoubtedly there's a huge amount of um jargon huge amount of language that 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 the broader crypto community is like <laughs> sort of like uh, this alphabet soup kind of feeling where you get like GMs constantly and, and GMIs and wag me and stuff like this. Right. We can get it. We can get into specific terminology and stuff if, if that's helpful. But basically for me, what I found um, sort of in NFTs, DeFi, crypto, et cetera, um, Twitter, it's Twitter was like the most powerful learning tool. And like it started with following you know, key companies and uh, key people that, like I mentioned, Chris Dixon, like he is a fountain of evangelization and learning, you know, in this space. Um, but I think that a common theme for, for the reason why I said earlier, this down, this, down the rabbit hole, um, the reason why that's a powerful metaphor is first of all, sometimes when you enter this like crypto web three space, um, you do have the impression that there's like this <laughs> subterranean world kind of like operating in parallel or alongside like the, the real world, quote unquote. Um, but the other reason is that there is a whole like feeling of being like, it, it's almost like a vortex. It's like pulling you in more and more and more. And so like for me, what my experience was like was once I had a taste of this and started to like understand, you know, concepts like rarity and like, you know, again, primarily through this, like, at least initially through this, like, fantasy football card game, you know, I, I just had this, like, really, really strong desire to, like, learn more and grasp more. And so, like, all of a sudden, I started thinking about, like, you know, it, was, it wasn't that far of a logic jump for me to start looking into DeFi and thinking about, like, lending protocols like Aave and, and Compound. Um, and so, from there, I started trying to, like, you know, watch every YouTube video I could find. There's two very fantastic books that the CoinGecko team and the Lab Brothers put together um, called How to DeFi. Uh, and so I like bought these books and just started like, first of all, they have step-by-step -step guides in terms of how to do like some of the basics in DeFi. Um, but they, they also like give you a lot, like all the terms will be defined really clearly, every aspect of the space. And so I started trying to build a foundation uh, centered around this, this language, right? Because it is a, a fundamentally different way of communicating. And I don't come from a finance background. You know, I'm much more on the like tech and marketing side. Um, so for me, I had to like learn like what, what are derivatives, you know? Uh, I had to learn about all this kind of stuff. And, and for me, it was like a lot of like investing time on Twitter, YouTube, and, and then trying to read and like like talk to anyone I could talk to in the space and that was before I started professionally that was like very much me like as a you know on a on, on the side you know trying to get involved in the spaces in any way I could um the good news is that Twitter is free uh YouTube is free um and many 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 resources online uh are free and so for me it was just like how can I consume as much um, as much of this as possible um and how can I start to really learn the language? It's a great point about language because it's not just these like memes and, you know, and like acronyms, right? There's a, there's a whole different language about the way people communicate about in this space. And uh, for me, it was, it was like once I could um, crack that code, you know, um, it, it became much easier for me to like want to get involved because uh, I could then understand the concepts and I could understand what was, what was cool to try, what maybe wasn't my you know, in my wheelhouse uh, and things I could maybe like <laughs> be aware of, but not necessarily like <laughs> try out myself or, or get too involved in. That's awesome. I mean, Web3 is definitely um, welcoming everyone pretty much, mm -hmm. you know, and like you have pointed out like a bunch of like resources that can help, you know, people who are new to the space and how to learn and how to be a part mm -hmm. of it. Really exciting that it's so community oriented and yeah, that's what excites us about Web3.
Thanks for sharing yeah. that. And uh, you touching a bit on DeFi, and I think for our audience, like DeFi is probably the most like far away from you know what is in their mind because it's still like finance, and people are more interested. Mm. Okay, like when they get in, they probably get into NFTs and not so much into uh, DeFi. So maybe mm. could you uh, quickly explain DeFi and what exactly got you excited? Because you know you said you're not coming from a finance background, but mm. Maybe in DeFi, there's something that everybody can now actually be excited about, um, about DeFi, especially. Sure. First of all, um, I think it's very common. Like, I, I certainly see, you know, NFTs and, and like Web3 more broadly as like um, almost like a Trojan horse to get people into like the wider crypto slash DeFi space. And so like, it's very common and okay to be like, okay, I'm investing and thinking about NFTs, but I'm not necessarily, I haven't wrapped my head around DeFi yet. So if there are people listening who who sort of feel that way, like I've been there, don't worry, <laughs> it's okay. And and to be fair, you don't have to ever actually get involved in, in DeFi if it's not something that, that excites you. Um, having said that, like, I think a good way to, to think about DeFi, you know, short for decentralized finance, if anybody doesn't know that, is to think about like the broad goal of many, many, many of the organizations uh, and, and builders, you know, kind of in this space is that they are trying to replicate many of the like real world banking use cases that are unfortunately reserved for certain people, certain countries, certain like wealth levels and income brackets. And they're trying to do that in a decentralized way, meaning that it's not controlled by any like one authority. Um, this is a pretty key thing to grasp and actually a quite a powerful concept if you think about it. Basically what it does is essentially puts the power of financial control in the hands of the people as opposed to you know, central banks and uh, you know, bankers with huge bonuses and things like that. Um, and I think if you're going to get excited by DeFi, you got to start there with the narrative. Um, maybe I'm a marketer, you know, like, and, and that's why I think that. But for me, that notion of like power, ownership, control, again, very linked very closely to the same concept with like digital artifacts and, and, and like art, you know, that you can have in the NFT space. Um, the link between that level of ownership and control is, is, is very important. Um, and so like, for me, that's where like, I'm like, started thinking about the, from a, from a finance perspective, it's like, of course it makes sense, right? Like, it, of course it makes sense. Like, you know, that, that, that maybe people should have more control over this than, than like a random, like central bank. There's also huge amounts of people who are unbanked, like Zerian, the founders of Zerian started with a mission of like, you know, many people, but banking the unbanked and opening up opportunities for those who might not have access. Um, I'm American. Many people who, who are crypto users right now are also American or from like privileged, you know, quote unquote backgrounds. And like a huge, huge, huge opportunity for decentralized finance is to actually help people that don't have the same advantages. So it's important to like think about DeFi as a route to empowerment and control and ownership um, more broadly. And, and I think that like that story is like really compelling. So I'd start there and like read all you can about like, you know, what it can what what the potential is you know get excited by the narrative because i think that if you start with that versus like okay how what's yield farming how do i think about that um you know i think you're going to be much more animated and excited by it especially if you're not like somebody who has a deep understanding of financial um like concepts and uh and and theor theories and stuff um DeFi itself there are kind of two key concepts, I think, that beyond that, like beyond the narrative that people need to understand. Um, the first is composability. And you're going to hear that a lot in the crypto space. And effectively what it means is, you know, a, a short term analogy or a, 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 an analogy that people in the crypto space draw is money Legos, right? The idea that these different services can be stacked on top of each other, combined in different ways, to leverage opportunities for the people who are using them. Um, what that means is there are things like staking. So if I have Ethereum or if I have Sushi tokens or if I have USDC or any other stable coin, I can basically stake them in a liquidity pool as in lock them into a liquidity pool. And then as people, other people draw off of that liquidity pool to make transactions, 
I can get percentages of those transactions and earn more money in the long term. Um, this is this is one of the primary applications of uh, DeFi in the I think as we know know it now. Um, and basically, what it means is these different things like you know these different tokens, these different protocols, these different services basically can combine together to do many different things for many different people. So composability is a important concept to to think through and read about and i'm you know i i can't claim to be the the biggest expert on the technical aspects of how this works um but i think that it's it's a very powerful concept to to understand and i think the second um maybe it's not a concept so much as a theme to understand in terms of decentralized finance DeFi these days is uh multi-chain right and like the emergence of other chains and networks beyond Ethereum. Um, so initially, you know, not even that long ago, actually, uh, there was like really one main chain that decentralized finance was happening on. This is the Ethereum blockchain. And within the last six months, uh, certainly within the last year, several other primary um, networks have emerged that like basically what they do is they make it, make transactions happen faster, they make them happen cheaper, and they allow more transactions per second to occur. Basically, they make Ethereum scalable. Um, they also are part of a transition to what's called proof of stake versus proof of, uh, proof of work, which is the way that Bitcoin network and Ethereum network um, worked initially, which means they're also more eco-friendly. So the main value propositions of, of layer twos and um, like the emergence of these other networks called layer twos in some cases, um, is basically scalability, speed, or scalability, cost, and and the environmental impact and energy impact. Um, so it's another major concept to start to grasp uh, if you're trying to learn about decentralized finance, because you're going to quickly come, like, I remember going, um, wait, hold on, I've got Ethereum, like, what is, <laughs> what is this Polygon thing, which is in the news lately, because they just, they just raised a bunch of money, like, what's Polygon, um, what's Binance, you know, how do I start to rationalize all this stuff, and it's, again, a part of the investment that we talked about before, in terms of um, learning the space, and learning the, uh, you know, learning, learning all the different languages, you also have to learn all the different technologies, uh, which can be quite complicated. So like, I recommend investing a little bit and figuring out how composability works from like a high level view, and then also starting to think about multi-chain and layer twos, um, so that you can understand when people are talking about optimism and arbitrum and all these other different, uh, uh, you know, certain networks that are emerging at the moment. Um, Hope that's clear. It was a little bit of a rambling answer. I apologize. <laughs> no, honestly, it was really, I think it was really great because uh, our audience who, I think you made it really clear about like, what are the advantages of DeFi for like creators that we have on in our community and everything. And that maybe finance, like I, for me personally, when I heard about DeFi and like I learned more about DeFi, I feel like it made me realize okay finance can actually be fun and this can actually be fun and we can have staking pools and we can have yeah. we can learn about this and we don't have to be afraid all the time about like you know um because of the centralized ways that we are taught i guess or that we know everyone like in school you think oh like you're kind of like afraid of your bank or you're kind of like afraid mm -hmm. of this finance as a big topic you know especially when you come from like a minority or you come from like a background where it's not that taught you know and I think DeFi is a good way to just learn, educate yourself and be like, okay, maybe there's a way for me of using my money better and staking and making more out of my money and also benefit the community around me. And also what you said on multi-chains, I think this is something um, which we are still figuring out because we are kind of like in a hype era of NFTs and everything where- for sure. um, you know, it, we need to preserve this like vision of Web3 where we really have like different uh, decentralized uh, applications and companies and not just, you know, one, uh, let's say project or one chain that is owning all of the um, projects. And right. yeah, I think you explained it in a really uh, understandable way. And I want to, yeah, it was definitely nicely explained. I wanted to add that like, you know, I think depending on where a person is located, they will probably define DeFi differently in a sense. Mm. Because, you know, if somebody's located somewhere in Africa or somewhere in somewhere else, you know, who knows what challenges they could face. So I think that um, I'd love to hear if you could just share a bit like about some of 
the potential challenges that you know a person could face because all this sounds really amazing i mean a lot of things about web3 sounds amazing but we also have to you know touch on the realistic you know mm. Things because if someone is watching this, then you're thinking, oh, I'm just oh, DeFi is like everything is perfect, DeFi perfect, you know. But you know there are challenges, and I would like it if you could touch a bit on that. Absolutely, um, and it's a great point. First of all, the notion that your perspective fundamentally changes not only what the challenges might be to, in DeFi, but also even what the advantages. Um, you know, I think there's this like idea that you know. Oh yeah, a, you know a, APY, you know yield, da da da, a thousand percent yield, and all this kind of stuff, and a very opportunistic sort of um, almost predatory type of type of environment. Like there is that side of this whole world too, right? Where like people invested certain amounts of money, and then because they hit at the exact right moment in the exact right protocol, all of a sudden, you know, huge, huge, huge gains that are like un, unforeseen in the real world. Personally, I find that aspect that side of the DeFi um, story to be less interesting than access and like opening up opportunities. Um, in terms of challenges, I think that relates very, very closely to the challenges. There's no doubt that the gas costs associated with trading on Ethereum mainnet, doing anything on Ethereum mainnet is prohibitive to a large percentage of the world. If you don't know what gas costs are, if you're listening to this and you're a little bit unclear about this, this would be essentially a network processing fee. Let's think about it that way. Like if you're doing something on your bank and you know the bank charges you a fee for making a specific transfer, if, like I do this all the time, you know, international bank transfers, right? There's a fee that the bank applies to you doing this. Gas is essentially the the and and the unit of measurement GWEI, G W E I. Uh, if you ever see this, that's what you know, we're talking about here. Um, gas is very prohibitive on Ethereum because it's very expensive. And what that means is, you know, if I'm even buying a, a $100 uh, or 100 euro uh, NFT, oftentimes the fee to buy that piece of digital art is more money than the thing I'm actually buying in the first place, which obviously means that decentralized finance and DeFi, you know, it, it's the same thing if you're trying to do something in the, in the DeFi space, like, like stake, a, you know, a particular amount of Ethereum or, or do a swap between Ethereum and USDC. Like every one of these interactions will have some sort of gas attached to it. And what that means is that it's obviously, um, unfortunately reserved or can be reserved. It's prohibitive for a lot of people, right? Because they don't have a disposable income because they don't have the ability to throw away money in gas because they're not like, you know, they weren't early to the, uh, you know, to Ethereum. And so they're just now trying to get into it. But this is, I think where layer twos are quite interesting um, and multi-chains are quite interesting because one of the clear benefits for them is that they're less expensive. And so in, on Optimism, for example, which has zero GUI, like there's no gas fee on optimism, you know, you if you buy a hundred euros of Ethereum, you're getting a hundred euros of Ethereum. You know, there's not like this, you know, you're you're credited or whatever uh, for a hundred euros of Ethereum. There's not like this extra fee on top. Um, so I think that a disadvantage certainly or challenge to adoption is is clearly on the um, on the on the gas. There's a gas element because there's a cost element. So unfortunately, I think Ethereum and, and a lot of decentralized finance is, is, is concentrated in places like Europe, you know, uh, uh, the US. Um, and, and I think that's, that's got to change. We got to get better and multi-chains are helping us get there. Uh, another challenge is particularly in non-Western countries. It's much more common for somebody to have a smartphone versus a computer. And unfortunately, the mobile user experience for some of these DeFi protocols and DeFi tools is really bad. Um, I mean, I don't know if any of you have MetaMask wallets, if you've created a MetaMask wallet, the MetaMask yeah. app, it's, it's, it's not the greatest user experience in the world. It's confusing, um, it's difficult to use, it doesn't cover all like you know if if you're not tracking a token and you do it you do a transaction somewhere you make a transaction somewhere oftentimes like your it will look like your money has just vanished uh, which is of course terrifying especially if you don't have tons of money to just throw away as I mentioned so I think that like the mobile user experience is definitely a challenge to DeFi adoption overall and we've got to get better as an industry in like catering 
like if we're going to ever really change like and open up access to people then we we need to make an experience that isn't so um clunky and isn't so like web browser centric like there's got to be an investment in in mobile because in, especially in in the non-western world like it's much more common for someone to have an iphone or or a smartphone than it is for someone to have a a mac you know or like a laptop sitting at their house um so i think that that's that's definitely a challenge we've got we've got to overcome uh, i think a third um adoption challenge is very based on education and luckily, unlike the traditional banking industry, the, as I said earlier at the top, um, there are free resources available to learn that like, if you want to learn, you can find the right things. You can find the right information. Um, but, but unfortunately, like a lot of these concepts, as I said, I'm coming to this as a non-finance background, um, but I think it can be even more off-putting if you're like coming from it like as a high school student, you know, or you're somebody who like really is like young, right? Or 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 comes from a, a place where where education isn't isn't so accessible like in your actual country. So like learning these concepts and how you can take advantage of them is is still a challenge and the industry must be better about communicating like to to people trying to grasp this stuff. Um, I kind of think that there's two bits of content that the industry does quite well from an education side. There is the like uber beginner, somebody who is looking up what like GUE stands for and like, you know, these kinds of terms. And then there is like the hyper advanced technical use case type of content. And in the middle, there's like this, you know, let's say 80% of the, the people in this space or looking in this space probably pretty quickly, you know, graduate off of that, like super easy to understand grasp content and are then trying to figure out like actual strategies. And there's not a whole lot of like content related to or, or educational material dedicated to like how to actually get, you know, go from like, okay, I'm literally, this is my first day. I've just opened my MetaMask account or my, you know, I've just created a wallet um, to like go on to the next level. And so I think that like education, unfortunately, is still a blocker. And like, there's a lot of people tackling this, both from like a, you know, just tweeting it <laughs> perspective and actually creating like great material. I, I really recommend it. If you're looking to get into DeFi, go to uh, how to DeFi. I don't know if it's howtodefi.com. Search how to DeFi by um, coin, the CoinGecko team and just buy them both. There's a really, really beginner version and they released last year, like in May, I think, an, an advanced version. And it's just a great place to start because you you won't get lost and it's very clearly written. I, I really am a big big fan of those books. They're they're great. Um, so yeah, those are three challenges I think. I will definitely uh, check that out. And you touched on something very important. Like we had an artist the other day with us, and he was talking about he was trying to set up his MetaMask and his country or something wasn't available, or he ran into so many like bar barriers, and it's like. We are still not there yet, you know, and, but also the thing is like there every day there's new things and new projects and keeping mm -hmm. up with all these things and what is really sticking out and staying around. And, you know, it's really like a lot of information, like mm -hmm. our coworker, she's super good with like being in every discord and, and I'm like, always like, wait, where, where is everything? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep up. But I think if you're uh, eager to learn and if you're hungry to learn, I really, I see it as such a big advantage for many people mm. who might not have the access to traditional education or to even be around certain people that they can, okay, you know what, I'm going to buy this book, I'm going to be in this discord, I'm going to just right. talk to people and try to learn as much as I can. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's actually a fantastic point that like, um, the mental health strain of, of Web3 can be um, can be overwhelming there's no other there's no other way to put it you know when when the industry is still especially on the nft side these days is very much like a bang in your chest like look how much money i made type of industry and the way people communicate about that um it can be a drain because like if you miss something like i saw, I saw a great tweet the other day which is not good podcasting but like i saw a great tweet the other day i can't remember who did it so if you tweet if you hear this and it it was you you can tag you know come at me and say i should credit you but basically basically he tweeted the guy tweeted you should always buy two jpegs 
You should buy one so that you can whine and complain about how you sold too early. And you can, the other one, you can hold, uh, you know, hodl until uh, it goes to zero. <laughs> and so like the point being, you're always going to feel like in this space, like you did whatever you did too early or you held on too late, you know, too long and now it's worthless. Um, and this sort of like slingshotty, you know, kind of feeling of emotions is like, it can be overwhelming. And so like, I think that that's another thing that we've got to do better in this space um, is like, okay, first of all, you're going to miss more than you hit, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's both missed opportunities as I didn't get in or I bought a thing and it actually is totally worthless. Um, but I also think that there's, you know, especially with DeFi, there are like tried and true blue chip kind of, like if you want to make the analogy, like blue chip type companies in, you know, sort of the traditional like stock market or something like that, that you can get involved in with a lot lower risk, clearly a lot lower reward most of the time now, but that can like give you a foundation to like feel like you are learning this. Um, I, when I was getting into this, I basically said to myself, like, I have to basically pay for an education right now. Like, I'm going to do stuff and I'm going to do it the wrong way. I'm going to spend too much in gas. I'm going to, you know, get into the wrong liquidity pool. Uh, I, you know, there was there there have been several hacks that have, uh, you know, drained certain protocols of money, which have happened since I've been getting into this space. You know, and so like, it, you can like really, really, really get in trouble if you're like betting too hard on things because there's a huge, huge, huge APY and potential yield. But I also think that now more so than even like a year ago or two years ago, there's like kind of like, you know, Ave is Ave, like fantastic, fantastic uh, organization. Like, and, and mostly what they're doing is just like consistently good. And so like betting on something like Ave to give you like a taste of what it's like to get into this, um, is probably a good place to start. Similarly, there are there are a lot of great NFT projects out there. I mean, I know we're talking about DeFi, but my real NFT like thesis, it's not a very complicated thesis, is try to be early. If you're not early, in, like basically buy and get involved in projects that like matter to you, right? So like projects are getting really good about like saying upfront, we believe in this, we believe in that. Um, great examples recently are like World of Women and like Crypto Coven, um, you know, that basically put like female empowerment and like enabling female artists in the NFT space, at, like the forefront of what they're doing. Like that's a mission that, that, that matters to me. I can get excited by that. And so like, you know, picking NFT projects like that, that have something going on behind it beyond, you know, random, you know, profile picture projects that maybe are a little less significant like i'm motivated by like social justice causes and I'm, like you know giving back and things like that maybe some other people aren't but i tend to pick projects and gravitate towards projects that have that sort of um sort of mission behind it and, and i think that increasingly this is becoming the norm at, at, rather than like or the rule rather than the, ex the exception so that means that like Again, if you're just getting started and you're not sure where to go and you feel a lot of pressure because you didn't get in on that Discord at the right time or you didn't see that tweet that you know promoted some whitelist opportunity, you know, I would just gravitate towards projects that um, you believe in and or have a mission that that matches with you. And the other thing is that you can join a Discord even if you don't own you know a specific NFT. And a lot of times the people on those um, in those communities because they were drawn by similar um you know sim similar missions and similar like uh, motivation like they'll oftentimes like post other communities that you can get involved in too and so you can actually get in the door by just focusing on communities that matter to you uh, and projects that matter to you and so like you can actually find out great opportunities for new projects or new things by just being a part an active member of the communities that uh that, that, that are, are working towards missions that you believe in. Uh, I love this. I think to sum it up really quickly for our audience, try to get in early on the projects and also try to be invested in a project you really care about is a good one, I think, to get started. I think FOMO of missing out is really real in this space. So like, hard. A couple of times, but um, yeah, you have to get over it and move on. Um, there will be another great project around the corner. And it, yeah. like you said, join communities that you feel like align with you and you will find people mm. who are interested in the same thing and so on. I think that's the best way to get started, right? I have legitimate 
friends in this space who I don't even know what they look like because they're anonymous and just put like their crypto coven as like their profile picture. And I'm in like, you know, seven discord communities with the same people, like the same, like, I don't know, 50 to hundred people, because like we, we were drawn to whatever project it was by the same, the same, you know, worldview. And so like, you know, the, the, the power of that is you can find your tribe really, really like quickly. And then because they're like, oh, hey, this is a great community. You should go over here. You know, you tend to like follow the, follow the same groups of people. And that, that aspect of um, Web3 is really compelling that you can like back projects that matter to you, um, that, that, that match your, your philosophy, your worldview and like things that matter. And, and I guess that's like a pretty like almost trite way to think about it. But like, I've found that I can manage my own FOMO because it's always there. It, it really is always, ah, oh, I should have bought that random game that like somebody told me about two, two, month, two weeks ago and now it's too late. You know, there is that like um, that FOMO, you know, it's sitting there. But I, I tend to like try to fight that off by just saying, you know what, like that's a project that I didn't understand. Or like that's a project that didn't really match with me. Uh, and or I didn't, it didn't click for me at the right time. And there's the good news is that there's a lot of great, great work being done out there on causes that matter, not just to me. Like there, there are plenty, like plenty of people are like super into gaming, right? And can sense when a game is gonna like really take off. And that matters to them. So they tend to gravitate towards projects and communities that are focused on that kind of thing. And that's great too. Like the, the beauty of Web3, I think, is that it's really easy to find your tribe. And once you do, like I say, you just randomly follow around all these people and these, uh, oh, hey, you're here too? Awesome. You know, this type of, uh, this type of thing, um, which also, like I say, opens up a lot of opportunities for you because people tag you in Twitter posts when there's like some giveaway, um, you know, people, people share stuff with you through the other communities you might be a part of. Um, and, and, and that ability to like, sort of like, like I said, find your tribe is like a really great way to also manage your own sanity and mental health. Because if you, if you, if you're, you know, wringing your hands every time you miss, you miss one, uh, it's really going to be hard to stay, uh, stay above water, uh, because there's just so much happening and changing. Um, so I just say find your tribe and like back projects that like, you have some kind of real connection with. It doesn't have to be mission driven. For me, those projects are, are, are compelling, but there's plenty of people who are not really into that. There's plenty of people who literally are like, I wanna try and find a project that I can flip for lots of money later. And that's fine too. I, I don't have any judgment about that. Um, and clearly that's a goal of the entire space, at least in some way. Um, but I do think that for me, like it's great to try to find a project that like has a, a mission and, a, and a, like a purpose that I that I identify with, um, and and you can find those. So so go find them. <laughs> uh, I really think this is uh, what you said is really great. You know, there's different maybe uh, incentives that incentives that you have with going for a project. It might be just for you liking the community, you like the brand, or you might want to uh, make some money out of it, but there's like obviously these both aspects. And I think if they balance out, then that's a great way to come together. Um, so my next question would be talking about Zerion, uh, could you quickly explain what you guys are doing and um, you know, what is so unique about uh, what you do with the work at Zerion? I, I read a bit into the projects and my coworker told me about, you know, regards to transaction history that you have like an overview yeah. of the investments and everything. So we want to know more about what you think is so great about that. Sure. Yeah. So, so Zerion, um, we like to talk about Zerion as mission control for Web3. Um, basically what our vision is to create a view where you can see all of your footprint across Web3, whether that's DeFi tokens and staking to NFTs and like, I don't know, different play to earn games that you might be in. Like we basically want you to be able to see and like find opportunities on Zerion. Um, we started as a portfolio tracker, which basically you connected your uh, crypto wallet and you know instantly you were able to see all of your assets together in one place with a nice graph to show your like profit and loss over time and like your performance of your portfolio and things like that. Um, quickly after that, we realized that if you can see your portfolio, you obviously want to buy things and invest. So we integrated with some of the main 
uh, decentralized exchanges, DEXs, um, and DEX aggregators from Uniswap and uh, SushiSwap to uh, Paraswap, uh, OneInch, Hashflow, um, many of the leading ones. And basically, you can swap assets uh, on directly on Zerian. Uh, we do not charge any um, like protocol fee. Like there's no Zerian fee on top, so the only fees you'll be charged are the network gas fees that we talked about before and the fee that the Dex provider uh, charges. But actually, that's what's great about Zerian trading on Zerian is that um, we, uh, because of we integrate with all those partners, for every time you do a um, you you try to execute a swap, we will pick the cheapest one, so you know that you're getting the cheapest price for you out you know out of those like six or seven uh, dexes that we work with. Um, you also have total control if you have, for example, like one inch rewards or you have the you know the Paraswap token or something like that. Um, you can choose which one you want to, even if it's not the cheapest, but it's going to default to the cheapest um, the cheapest trade for you. Uh, and, and once that sort of all that functionality kind of came into play, it, it was sort of a, the right time for us to start thinking about NFTs. And so within the last six months or so, we've added a lot of features for NFT holders. Um, everything from like, as you mentioned the transaction history, which was, uh, which used to be just for um, like, like tokens and, and DeFi protocols. Now your NFT purchases and trades are visible in your transaction history. Um, you can filter by floor or the floor price or the last price that your NFTs were, were bought for. Um, you can see all the detailed attributes all in one place. Uh, you can set a, set your NFT, your favorite NFT as a widget on your iPhone or a, a face on your Apple Watch. And so basically we started to try to try to make like uh, Zerian a great place to not only have your like DeFi assets, um, but also a way to like show off and maintain and track your, uh, your NFT collections as well. Um, and so this is mainly because we think that what were two very separate worlds are quickly converging to essentially be like the same thing. Like people think about them in the same way, they treat them in the same way, and, and people want to see like the same functionality with their NFTs that they can with any of the tokens that they uh, have on the platform. Uh, I met, we've talked a little bit about multi-chain. So Zerian supports tracking and trading for um, six blockchains or six networks, excuse me, um, aside from Ethereum, so seven in total. And we're adding about two more, three more within the next couple of weeks. And so it soon will be up to 10 networks. Um, and so like, you know, we, we really are trying to enable like anyone within the Web3 space, no matter what chains or networks they have the most positions on, no matter what asset, like sort of an aspiration for us is to be able to offer every asset, every chain on every device. Um, this is sort of like a internal motivation for us. Uh, and so the, the idea is that all of this world, DeFi, NFTs, Web3, it's all very spread out. We want to bring it all together into one place so you can do all this and see everything you've got uh, uh, in, one, in one location. That's amazing. I think uh, she explained it to me like, you know, uh, she, she uh, checked on Zerion and was like, oh, I found some investments that I forgot about. And, you know, it's kind of like finding some money in your pocket or, you know, and she was like, she, because she said she has different, you know, areas of investments. And then, you know, to keep track of all these platforms is like very like hectic and difficult, I guess. And could you explain like, does this feature of like, you can see, let's say the best price on where to buy. Is it kind of like a sky scanner where you can check out the best prices or how does that work? It's a pretty good comparison, actually. I, I mean, effectively, like what I wish I could show you all, but essentially when you go to do a swap, like let's imagine a scenario where we are um, using Ethereum. We're, we're on Ethereum mainnet for the moment. Let's just stay on Ethereum. Uh, so we're going to do a trade for USDC, like Ethereum for USDC. So we're swapping those two tokens. And the way it will work from, from our web or mobile app um, is you go to the swap uh, tab, you choose the tokens you want to exchange and how much you want to exchange of Ethereum in this, in this example. And what we will do is calculate, we'll basically do some magic on the back end, and then the user will see like this trade is being offered by X, uh, so 0X protocol, for example, or, or 1H. This trade is being offered by 1H, and then it will show the total cost, gas included, et cetera, of executing that trade. If you click on the offered by, you can then see what all the other 
exchanges are offering. And you can, like I say, you can choose if you, for some reason, have an incentive to use one network over another, or excuse me, one uh, exchange over another, you can, you can do that. Um, but otherwise, by default, we're going to give you the cheapest one. So actually, it's, it's not a bad, it's not a bad way to think about it, because you can have the same functionality in Skyscanner, where it's like, you can actually, you can go through like this website, or you can go to like, airfrance.com and it's going to be this price you know you can, like if exactly. you have like that's what i was thinking yeah. about because that explained to me in a more simple uh way, it's, with it's really thing <laughs> but it's for a crypto so that it's amazing and then you have the mission to bring all of these like you said it's very spread out but you guys want to bring it together i think that just makes a lot of sense to have a place where you can overlook everything that you're doing with your investments and your nfts and everything yeah yeah, our, our, our vision, I think, is like people increasingly are like right now, it's OK that it's spread out and just dis, like dispersed because the people who are like earliest adopters in the space are like fine with, you know, sort of connecting the dots a bit. But increasingly, as new people come into this space, as people who maybe didn't have tokens before, but were like NFT holders come into this space, so they don't get all the, the technical nuts and bolts behind all this stuff, is like a lot of this technical stuff is going to be like abstracted away. And that means that people want a user experience that, that makes sense and is easy to understand and, and is easy to, to, to sort of jump into this space, like lowering the barrier to entry. And, uh, and I think that's kind of like a, an original mission behind why we built Zillion. Um, it, it's increasingly something that informs, particularly on the mobile side, how we think about different features to add to the, to the mobile app. I have to say our mobile app is like a great place to be. It's a really, really fantastic experience, especially on iOS. I'm, I'm an Apple user, so like <laughs> the Android is great too. If, if my Android developers are listening, uh, you know, the, the Android is great too app is great too, but the, the, we really invested an awful lot in the user experience of this and making it as simple and as clear to understand as possible because I, I, we said it before with like adoption and like getting into the space, like if the barriers to entry are very high and you have to be some kind of like, you know, finance expert to understand all this stuff and to benefit, well, you know, the, the, the total people that can be reached by this is inherently like, you know, limited. And I think that what we're trying to build with Zerian is something that really is available for everyone and accessible for everyone. So like the, 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 the mission behind what we're trying to do is create something that's just a great user experience so that at the basic level, people trust it, they understand what they're getting into and they can like explore this whole web three space without like thinking, oh my goodness, like the stress, you know, like we mentioned before, like, oh my God, what happened there? Did I do that right? Did I send it to the wrong address? You know, all this kind of stuff that that really happens. Um, you know, it really happens. The the use case you mentioned with your friend of like, oh, I like found money. This happens all the time when people connect their wallets to us because they just didn't know that they were eligible for an airdrop or something like that, but then is sitting there um, because they didn't go back to that one protocol that was, you know, they had tried out six months ago. Um, and so you know, it's, it's a very common use case for us and, and, and something that I think is like really informing the way we build the product and also like what's coming, what's coming next for Zerian, um, which is exciting too. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna add that it sounded like you're describing me about, you know, wondering if if my transfer went through and what happened and did I get the address right and um, yeah, it kind of sounded like me and I also wanted to say that no wonder uh, Zarian has grown to become one of the most popular DeFi interfaces in the world, because you know it, you guys are focused on the, you know, like user, uh, making sure it's user friendly, you know, mm. and that's important because everything with web3 is great but sometimes you're know, navigating some of these things can be quite tricky so the more we make it easier and accessible the better you know and you know i was i was thinking like right now we're seeing a lot of things about web3 maybe in like five years or a few years to come we will look back and go like oh like none of these really make sense you know because there's so much potential and it's going to evolve yeah. Like a few years to come, we'll be like, oh, we're now in Web four, and what we thought was in Web three was like mm -hmm. this and that. So yeah. that's that's incredible. You were uh, talking about gaming. You touched a little bit about mm -hmm. about gaming, and I'm wondering what your opinion, if you have any opinions um, on the metaverse, the topic of the metaverse. Mm -hmm. Move a little bit there. So first of all, I think the my the metaverse as a construct and as an idea is extremely powerful. 
um, this this digital environment where like ownership is encoded onto a publicly readable blockchain, you know, is like very, very, very exciting. Um, I think that the biggest problem that I have with the metaverse is that there, first of all, currently there are there is not a metaverse. There are metaverses. Um, and one of the things that that people building you know, towards a metaverse need to figure out and and understand, and I think it's coming, is like how how these things are supposed to interact with each other. Like how how is like, so if I'm, you know, playing the sandbox or if I'm buying plots of land, digital plots of land, well, like how do I use um, like an avatar from, an, from a game in there? How do I get my you know, so rare collection into my little uh, plot of land so I can display my collection. Um, you know, Sandbox is doing this a little bit with like plots of land that are like, have an NFT on them. I'm sure you've you've seen these uh, in, in the Sandbox, which is a very, very big um, uh, sort of metaverse game play to earn gaming. Um, but I think that the, the, the challenge right now in terms of the metaverse is that it's very um, uh, disparate. And and, and like also it's just multiple metaverses that are sort of interacting vaguely together, but not really in any kind of cohesion. And actually this is my real fear. Uh, and I think that um, clearly meta or formerly known as Facebook, the artist formerly known as Facebook is making a play that they should define like what this metaverse looks like. To be fair, they're not the only major tech company doing this. But they are certainly the one that has been the most, I think, outspoken and like upfront with those plans. And my real fear with that is I don't want one company deciding what the metaverse is. I like a vision of the metaverse that is built by everybody and contributed to by everybody. And the problem is <laughs> Facebook has many, many billions of dollars to throw at defining what this user experience should be, which, which things should be allowed. And in that case, we're not any better than, than Web2. And so my real fear with the metaverse is if we allow one company to dictate how this, what this looks like, um, I think that we fall into many of the same traps that we uh, have with Web2. Um, and especially if we let one of the most egregious uh, uh, exploiters of people's privacy, data, and, and information uh, to dictate this, I think we're in a dangerous spot. Uh, I would love if everybody just said, this is like boomer metaverse and nobody used it. Uh, we'll, we'll see. They are investing a lot of money and resources into making it like the metaverse. And so I kind of think like, I mean, who knows, but if they are successful at creating that, I sort of think that what will happen is like Web3, like the Web3 community will just like either stop using that term or just define their own metaverse and make it something that like, if you're in the Web3 ecosystem, this is what our metaverse looks like. Um, because I don't see a whole lot of incentive to like port in or like, you know, incorporate the like Facebook version of what the metaverse is into like what we're trying to build. Um, and so I think we're in a dangerous spot for the metaverse, to be honest, because I think that they're signaling so um, clearly that they're going to invest time and energy into this means that they're going to give it their all. And, you know, a company with that many employees, that many engineers and that much money doing that, you know, they're not, they're not, they're certainly not going to, when they've changed their name to Meta, they're certainly not going to abandon it lightly. You know, uh, this is clearly a vision that they believe in. I also think that unfortunately, they're what they are articulating. Just as another side note on the, the Meta Facebook uh, team, what they're building is basically like, oh, VR, right? You know, it's like VR, and I kind of think that's like it's like an aspect of what I consider to be the metaverse, but it's not the only aspect. Like it doesn't have to be only VR. Um, there's like these games that we're talking about here, you know, many of them are not VR and maybe never will be VR. Uh, and so like, I think that even they're already taking a stance of like, what is the metaverse that feels limiting and uh, restrictive? And I just, I just don't really like that. <laughs> I, you said something very interesting is that like how it's funny when you see like very web three, comp uh, web two companies and they just take like, you know, we work for like 
there's people working on these projects for like years and they want to be innovative and then web two companies come and they're just like grabbing the features or grabbing the names and it's like yeah. what are you doing but um yeah. yeah unfortunately i there's also downsides of this whole thing but um there's many possibilities i just think it's uh, i talked to a friend yesterday and he said oh the french are building like a french metaverse and i was like is this gonna be like then what is it like what do you mean is this just gonna be for french people is this just only gonna be french art or but uh he really explained that like it's for everyone but it's like you know maybe there's different metaverses or different kind of um concepts that you can enter in, in that kind of way for me the most craziest thing is thinking about real estate and like mm. like uh like what does it mean if I buy like a place on the metaverse or on decentraland like I think that that concept is still something that I have to uh, wrap my head around somehow but yeah we will see what's uh what will how it will be yeah uh, you're not you're not alone sorry go ahead <clears throat> no I wanted to add that you know um you touched on a lot of amazing points and I think this is a really great perspective that you've given our audience and I would say so far you're like the first person that has sort of um, expanded the topic in this in this like direction and it's it's definitely uh, great because I remember the first time I I think I asked a friend of mine about metaverse and he just said Facebook oh you mean the Facebook thing that Facebook is working on that we're gonna wear those things as on glasses or something like yeah. that and I was like no it's not a, you know it's not a Facebook thing but yeah you are right um however like you said we are going to define our own metaverse metaverse and web3 if needed because even like for instance in fashion like in digital fashion um there's only so far you can push like the boundaries of reality so the mm -hmm. metaverse you know it, it's sort of like for designers and, and other creators it's sort of opens this this freedom of innovation right like there's so much we can do in this space and um i think that from that point of view it's going to be great we don't know exactly how it's going to look like but you know we all we all have a role to play in it joy and i ours is to have these uh conversations with great mm -hmm. people like yourself who can you know touch on such amazing points and to educate but yeah we will all see what happens you know in a few years to come I agree. Yeah, the fashion is just to 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 carry on your point. Fashion is a great example, and I think right. also illust illustrates potentially why a Facebook dominated metaverse is is potentially scary to me. Um, <clears throat> there are many many digital fashion brands emerging in like this this Web three uh, space, right? Like if we think about this sort of broadly, um, and is it really all that hard to imagine a scenario where Facebook only allows like advertisers fashion to be in their metaverse? Is it really so hard to imagine a place where they're like, oh, that person isn't paying us money. So clearly like your, your digital clothing, your digital fashion items won't be allowed to be viewable, usable, accessible in this space. It's not, it's not at all because they do this stuff all the time. They're gatekeepers, right? And, and I think that, you know, this illustrates why to me, them trying like setting out so so clearly to try to create this space is problematic and, and something that, that people in this space should either fight to reclaim the term or simply just go, you know what, fine, have metaverse, we're going to build something else. Um, because I think that so much of what this space offers is freedom of expression, ownership, access, um, and things that we've talked to touch, touched on a lot in this, this conversation. You know, and and they are not about this, despite the fact that that's all they talk about. Hey, it's freedom of expression, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. They're not. They're not. What they want is for advertisers to be able to sell exactly the right message to exactly the right person because this person has done or reacted or said X thing. And that means that they are going to block gatekeepers, put up guardrails, and, uh, you know, dictate the experience for all of us. And I don't think we should allow them to do that. Um, that's that's my my feeling anyway. right <laughs> so be aware of kind of like the greenwashing in uh in the web3 space or you know uh you have to really take a look like it's something we in the company talk about as well like are our uh, incentives straight are, are, is our vision aligned do we do everything that we can to make it uh 
align with our values and our like you know the core things we believe in and mm -hmm. that is something that i think we all have to double check every time like who we invest in and not just blindly mm -hmm. follow like one company or one thing you know and yeah. really great that you touched on that i'm wondering um to wrap it up i think we had yeah, sure. <laughs> such a great conversation but um what are you looking forward to in the future maybe and some last key takeaways you might want to share with us sure i'm um I'm really excited by, uh, I, I said it earlier, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's something that really matters to me. And, and I think it's a, a, something broadly exciting about the entire Web3 space. Is I, I'm really excited by um, NFT projects in particular that are opening doors to people who have either been blocked out or not, uh, you know, their, their voices haven't been as heard. Um, in, in, in many other industries, uh, uh, you know, sort of historically and like in actual recent memory. Um, I mentioned World of Women. There are many, many other projects that are shining a light on sort of communities that are, are underrepresented, unfortunately, in many other areas of society. I just think that the continued like democratiz democratization or the continued uh, like spotlight that projects like World of Women or Crypto Coven or um, uh, Rebel Society, many, it seems like that, that I, I, I am seeing a lot of female led projects discussing and funding and participating in female empowerment to, to sort of be emerging in the last like few months. And I think that that's going to continue. And I, I think it's going to extend beyond females or, you know, women and start to sort of touch on other marginalized or, or underrepresented communities as well. I think that's just like fascinating and the best. Uh, we should be in favor of that, like everywhere. And like, for me, those are projects where I'm like, you know, I got to get behind that. That's so such a great mission and vision. Um, so like, I'm really excited by that. I also think that the, like, this is already happening with like Axie and some of the bigger gaming play to earn games. I think that play to earn gaming is like a legitimate, you know, career or like a legitimate way to like make money is going to continue to spread because gaming is, I mean, the, the, the Justin can the other day tweeted that like, you know, he built Twitch and he thinks like NFT games are going to like even, you know, blow away play to earn gaming is going to blow away anything that's happening on, on Twitch and gaming, the gaming community right now. And it's, it's so easy to see why, because if you are part of a play to earn game, you own a piece of it. So you're invested literally and figuratively in its success, in its usage, in spreading it. And that like, that like in, in implicit network effect means that these kind of games can take take off in ways that you could never see before. Um, you know, Axie Infinity is one of the most widely known and recognized play to earn games. And like, it's literally making careers out of it for people in, you know, corners of the world that traditionally have depressed wages and, you know, really have a hard time making, you know, making a living. And, and I really believe that these sorts of use cases are gonna continue to open up for people to, to take advantage of them and actually make careers and make, make li their lives better. Um, so I think that like gaming as like a route to to legitimate financial empowerment is a uh, a, a really important trend that, that we need to see happen. And I also think that like this is this is getting a little bit back to Zerion and, and kind of our space, but I think that this continued idea that the abstraction of all the technical sophistication nuts and bolts happening underneath, um, you know, the fact that that is like invisible to the average user, and the user experience improvements that come along with that. Like, I just think 2022 is the year where like a lot of this stuff just goes under the hood and we don't have to think about it anymore. You just use a product, use a tool, you use an organization that you, you know, you're, 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 you're actively excited by and you don't have to understand all this technical stuff. And I think that's gonna be a real key. Somebody, somebody, I can't remember which bank, but someone said recently that like crypto was gonna hit like a, a, a sort of a, an inflection point for like hyper adoption soon, where they were predicting that. And I think that the, the user experience improvements are like a fundamental driver in that actually happening. Um, because more, the, the, the less barriers there are to even, even understanding what's happening, the, the, the easier it's gonna be for someone like, I don't know, like my mom to to get into this and figure out how to how she can, you know, buy an NFT or make her own NFT or whatever. Um, and I guess like that broadly is 
it gets to my last thing I'm really excited by, which is like creator, I don't know, like creator empowerment, creator, like opening up opportunities for creators across the board. Um, clearly Spotify is in the, the headlights of some of this lately, but I think they're in the headlights for the wrong reason. They, they, they're, you know, kind of getting a lot of bad press lately because of like, you know, Joe Rogan and this whole fiasco. If you haven't followed it, don't worry about it. But like they're, they're in a lot of like sort of free speech and censorship kind of discussions. I actually think that what we should be talking about with Spotify is how little they pay the artists who are the lifeblood of their product, like for the streams that they have. It's, it's pathetic. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the more we are opening up opportunities for people to like make a living creatively, um, the, the more like excellent creative work we will see. Um, because once it doesn't become something that you have to like sacrifice your livelihood to like become a musician, um, the, the more great musicians there are out there. Many people aren't prepared to take the risk currently because of the way that the system is set up. If there's a, a way to get started without, um, you know, <laughs> living living out of a shoebox and you know sleeping in your car for several years in order to get your start maybe more people will, will jump into that path and I think that's just a good thing for everybody I just want to quickly touch on the last part because it really uh, speaks to me a lot and I think to Salimi as well this is like one of the big reasons why we joined uh, or we mm -hmm. are currently doing what we're doing because we have friends that like I have personally friends that work in music or work uh, in the arts or work in fashion and uh, unfortunately, these are very um, not so good paid or uh, monetized um, mm. jobs sometimes and it's really hard for them and that's like for me seeing now like music NFTs and like talking to uh, like label managers and how they are excited for these things I think that would be like the best thing for for us to see as well like seeing mm. individual stories of people who actually you know are it's not about like you make like a billion dollar of your music NFT but it's like everybody can like is this idea of like everybody can live more their passion they can do more of what they love and they can uh make a living with these uh technologies i think that's what yeah. really uh, really speaks to me um yeah, I, I saw a, a musician say recently that he he had made more selling four nfts than he had with four million streams on spotify i mean no. i think clear <laughs> Clearly, that's the problem, right? And and I don't want to. Spotify is a great company. I've been a loyal user for a long time. But when you start to think this through, it's clear that the model isn't working in terms of opening up opportunities for new artists and musicians to 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 like follow their dream, right? And you know, Bandcamp has been around for a while trying to do this uh, on the music side. There are many other sort of like small ways for artists to get going and get their start. Uh, sound, you know, SoundCloud for a while, especially for like rappers and things like that was a big one for a while, but it's clear that the model is broken. And I think that the potential for more creators to get started and be in this space and develop communities um, and fans, like a fan base, like the potential is just so there. And it, I can't wait to see what kind of what kind of people get into this space um, because of these new opportunities to, to, to actually do it, you know, because um, I think there are, unfortunately, there have been a lot of blockers for people. Right, right. It's it's really an exciting time to be, you know, to be an artist, especially because of Web3, you know, because because of all the tools, the possibilities and innovation it brings and, you know, empowering creators to take, take control of your voice, your data, your privacy and you know, focus more on, on creating value, you know, versus buying into the hype because, you know, you want to kind of fit in kind of. So yeah. this is really great. Um, thank you so much. Really. Sure. Um, you said a lot of amazing things and I think um, our audience are going to enjoy this episode and there's just so much to learn um, from sure. this episode. Thank you so much, and and I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you could share your 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 social platforms, maybe anywhere sure. our audience find you sure so um first of all you can if you're interested in zirian and finding out more about zirian you can go to zirian.io uh and if you go to app.zirian.io you can connect to your wallet and get started right away so you don't have to read all the all the marketing spin on our homepage. um 
you can also join our Discord. We have a really, really active great, two great community managers on our Discord who can answer questions and we're very available. So uh, you can even talk to me directly on our Discord. Uh, you can find the links on our website. So uh, don't, you know, it's very easy to find us there on our Discord. Um, you can also follow me specifically. I'm most active on Twitter and you can follow me at uh, AlexanderGuy19 uh, on Twitter. So if you want to follow me or DM me, please, I'd love to have a conversation. That's awesome. And we'll put all the links in the description. So audience, don't worry. You know where to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being part of today's forum. And if you want to get more involved also in our community, make sure to follow us on our social platforms. We have Twitter as well. We have uh, Instagram. And also we have a private Telegram group where we update everyone what is happening um, within our community. And we will link everything down below. And don't forget to uh, like and subscribe and follow up with the next new forum. Thank you so much, Salimi. Thank you so thank you. much. And it was such an insightful episode. And yeah, looking forward to hearing more from you and Zirion. Thank you so much. Bye. See ya. Bye for now.